Hi, I'm Aaron Norby, postdoctoral associate at Yale. Uh, this is an introduction to my article, Uncertainty Without All the Doubt, for the Brains blog. So, I intend this video introduction to be something like a movie trailer for my paper. Uh, I'm just going to try to give you a, a sense of what I try to do uh, in the paper, some of the issues I discuss, just to give you an idea of whether you might want to go ahead and read the actual paper, or maybe just continue on down to the commentaries. So, I'll start with an example. Let's say that you like to ride a bike to work. So, pretend it's not the middle of winter with snow everywhere, um, like it is where I am. So, every day, you pump up your tires for maximum gas mileage, maximum speed. You go on your way thinking, you know, how great your tires are, uh, each day you say, these tires are going to get me to work super fast. So now imagine that instead of thinking about your tires today, what's going to happen today, uh, I ask you to just stand back and think about the whole collection of rides that you're going to take over the next few months. Uh, are you going to get a flat tire at least one of those times? Or maybe not over the next few months, maybe over the next year. Are you going to get a flat at least once? And you might say, sure, of course, you know, the shoulders of roads are filled with glass and other junk, and flats are just a part of life for a bike commuter. So when you take this overview, you think, all of your, think of all of your rides sort of all together as a collection arrayed before you. Um, you know, you think the, the possibility of a flat looms out at you. Um, but when you're focused in every day, thinking about today, it's as though there could be nothing further from, you know, nothing more unlikely than a flat tire. Um, so should we say, uh, you know, that day to day, that uh, you're absolutely certain that you won't get a flat? Uh, no. Why? The overview, the view you take when you have the big overview, suggests that you're sort of, in some sense, you're well aware that any day you might get a flat, that there's always some small chance of that happening. What we should say instead is that the amount of uncertainty you have about your tires getting a flat has some instability, uh, that what we might call your momentary credence, so the confidence you manifest now in a particular situation, isn't identical to any stable or stored attitude that you carry around with you. So your momentary credence, the credence that actually guides your thinking and your behavior, uh, depends in part on sort of how you're conceptualizing things now, what possibilities have been brought to mind, uh, and some other things like that. So what I really want to say then is that your credences uh, are constructed from situation to situation rather than stored and ready to guide decision making in the way that in philosophy we typically think of beliefs and credences uh, as being. So the basic idea, we don't really have credences so much as construct them. You face a decision, there's a process, a process that I call decision setup, that involves basically figuring out what possibilities are going to be considered in making that decision. Uh, and then it also involves afterwards sort of assigning levels of confidence to those possibilities, that is taking up some particular credence or other. Um, but sort of like in the flat tire example, the, the level of confidence that you assign depends on various features of the situation. Um, including how you're framing things, what other possibilities have come to mind, and are readily available, and the result is variability in confidence levels. All right, so one result of this is I think that we should think of how our credences are formed, think about how our credences are formed, not just in the traditional evidence collecting and reasoning ways, but in this other way that involves on-the-spot construction and cognitive processes that are not entirely open to reflection and executive control. We can think of these questions in both epistemological and cognitive scientific terms. In the paper, I think about them more in the latter sort of way. Uh, so the project is, is one that we might want to call a project in a, something that we might want to call naturalized formal epistemology. It's 
part philosophy and part cognitive science of credences. Um, the paper by itself isn't doesn't present a, what I take to be a complete theory. Uh, rather, it tries to make progress on questions about the extent to which credences and related constructs familiar from epistemology have psychological reality. Uh, in what ways do we have credences? In what ways do our most credence-like mental states depart from how philosophers typically think of them? And, uh, and what cognitive processes are involved in the creation, updating, and use of these sorts of states? So to give you a better sense of the kind of answer I give, uh, I'm gonna, I want to make a comparison that I make briefly in a footnote in the paper. And so, so it's to this idea, uh, which has a lot of empirical support, that very often when we confront a choice, so should I check my tire pressure before I get on the road today, or should I not bother, uh, we don't have our preferences pre-packaged and ready to go. Rather, our preferences are constructed on the spot. So this is preference construction. Uh, in my response to some of the commentaries, I have uh, um, some citations uh, for the relevant literature. Uh, and the idea is sort of that our preferences are constructed. It doesn't mean that our preferences are totally arbitrary or that sort of until you're faced with a choice between, say, drinking soap and drinking a really good beer, it's just undetermined what your preference will be. Uh, rather, um, sort of more, most choice situations aren't so simple as that. Um, so would you prefer to keep your $32 or buy a round of drinks for your friends? Do you want to make a plan to go to the gym more frequently, or are you satisfied with how often you go now? Uh, of course, things get more complicated when there's more uncertainty involved about the outcomes of of potential decisions and when the options are harder to compare. Uh, but the, 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 the idea is that sort of when we, when we go to sort of form our preferences, we use uh, both stored information. So maybe I have a good idea of how often I go to the gym each week on average. And then we also use cues that are readily available in the particular situation. So maybe um, we look at the friend who happens to be with us at the moment, how often do they seem to go to the gym, and use that as a benchmark. Um, since, But since both the information retrieved and the cues available can change from situation to situation, uh, the way we construct preferences uh, relating you know, one particular good to another, one particular choice to another, um, will have some instability to it. Uh, again, that's not to say that anything goes, it's just to say that things aren't settled before a decision is actually encountered. And in the paper, uh, one thing that I try to do is point out that there are a number of ways in which our credence-like states seem to be a lot like this. So the way I put it in the paper is that our degrees, the degree of uncertainty you'll seem to have about something, about the outcome of an event, the truth of a proposition, is subject to the same sort of variability. Um, in that sense, we should think of our credences, like our preferences, as things that we construct, rather than states or attitudes that we have. Um, this is a psychological thesis, which means that there are many caveats and boundary conditions and potential exceptions. Um, some of those I address in my responses posted below, uh, but I think of really a full understanding of the cognitive states and processes uh, surrounding our doxastic attitudes in general is a long way off. Um, what I'm trying to do is point in a promising direction. So thank you for listening. Thank you for reading. Thanks to Jennifer Nagel, Keith Frankish, and Nicholas Smith for really challenging and great comments. Uh, a big thanks to Robert Briscoe and the crew at the Brains blog for putting this on. And I don't often say this about the internet, but I'm really looking forward to reading the comments. Thanks.